Welcome to Real Shame, a weekly film podcast where we review movies from our movie blind spots. I'm Adam. I'm Andy. And on this week's episode, we're going to talk about The Graduate, Graduate. with Dustin Hoffman and Bancroft and Catherine Ross. But before we get into that lively discussion, we always like to start off each episode talking about kind of what we've been watching recently, what we've been into. What have you been watching recently, Adam? So... A little bit behind the scenes of the podcast, we were trying to figure out a good movie to pair this movie with. Mm-hmm. And we kind of went back and forth on different titles. And so the one movie I want to call out that I've been seeing was actually Adventureland. So I know you're not the biggest fan of Adventureland. No, no, no. I I love Adventureland. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? I, yeah, really. <laughs> Under the impression that you did no, like I, it. No, I really, I really, really dig Adventureland. Yeah. I do. So not to spoil my review a little bit more, but I wish The Graduate was a little bit more Adventureland <laughs> than uh, The Graduate. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I wanted to find a movie, and what we settled on calling these movies kind of like a post-college malaise kind of film, right? hmm So I wanted to find a movie that was in that same vein where you have someone that's after college and they have to get their life together. And I thought Adventureland was a really good example of those kind of movies. I think... Um, just the acting's great. I think the it was done by Greg Matola, the same person who did Paul, the movie about the alien. Uh, Not a great movie, yeah, I but know. I thought it was a really good movie, and I figured it fit this theme that we we're going for pretty well. What about you? What have you been watching? Uh, I watched a few things, so I I caught up on a couple of movies from 2019 that I missed seeing in the theater. One was Fighting with My Family. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, it was. It was, it was good. It was. It was a fun movie. I don't know. I don't know if I love it, but I yeah, I thought it was a good movie. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's one of those movies. I, I don't think there's anything that you can't see coming, but yeah. it's kind of a feel good, you know, story, and it checks all the boxes of that kind of a film. Yep. But it's very competently done. Stephen Merchant directed. He's also in the film with his slender man <laughs> physique. Uh, I really, really like Florence Pugh. I, yeah. I think that she's really going places. She was nominated for an Oscar at the Academy Awards this year. She yep. did not win, but I feel like there's definitely going to be an Academy Award for her sometime in the future. It doesn't hurt to have The Rock in your movie. He nope. always you know, kind of lifts the material. Unless uh, so that, that was movie fun. is Jumanji 2, Welcome to the Junk. Or I, I can't, <laughs> comment. Over I can't comment on the, the Jumanji movies. Or Skyscraper. But uh, no, I, I enjoyed fighting with my family. I don't know a lot about Paige, the, the wrestler in real life. Yeah. And apparently the movie is not 100% accurate. Shocker. Oh no. Yeah, but uh, but still I enjoyed it for what it was. The other movie that I saw that I, or caught up on that I missed in theaters was The Art of Self-Defense with Jesse Eisenberg. Oh, that's cool. How and was that? I was extremely disappointed in it, honestly. I, I, It's a dark comedy. I like dark comedies. I just felt like... I mean, you should check it out and yeah. let me know what you think, but I, I felt like it it took way too long to get to really the yeah. darker parts of the story, and by that point, I just kind of lost interest. So I was like, eh. The the preview for the art of self defense remind me a lot of the movie that um, the guy went on to play Kenny Powers from Eastbound and Down his first movie, um, the Danny McBride. Danny McBride yeah. uh, it looked a lot like that movie. Oh yeah, Foot Fist Way. Yes. Yeah. So was that the same kind of? Eh, I mean, other than the fact that they both have karate in them or whatever, I don't think they're they're all that similar. I mean, the art of self defense is much much darker, yeah. and I did. I, I did kind of like those parts of it, but it just took forever to get there. That was my my biggest issue with it. So I would say overall it was a, a pretty big disappointment. I, I prefer the foot. I don't even like Danny McBride, McBride that much, but I prefer the foot fist way. Yeah, I could say it. Foot fist way. Foot fist. I way. prefer the foot fist way to uh, art of self defense. That's your style of kung fu is the foot fist way over the. Um... Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. for me, like I like Jesse Eisenberg. Normally, I feel like he got too much into the neurotic stuff in a lot of his movies. So I kind of distanced myself from him a little bit. It kind of wasn't easy for me to relate to him. Like like Lex Luthor? Or like, like Lex what, what Luthor. Mean? I think a little bit after The Social Network, he was just kind of in that kind of vein of being like a neurotic kind of uh, character and stuff like that. And it was kind of not my thing. Gotcha. Well, he was, he was great in Adventureland. Well, I it, think he was. I think that. it was very subdued. Like, I don't think he was like leaning into being kind of this neurotic or having a bunch of neuroses or having a bunch of things. He seemed, it seemed like a very, like he seemed normal. It seemed very like slice of life kind of 
um, kind of movie. And maybe when we get to graduate, I'll kind of refer back to that a little bit. All righty. Well, that sounds like a good transition to talk about the graduate. Jesus, God, no. What an asshole. talking earlier about you know why, why why was this a movie that you know we picked obviously adam had not seen it yeah. i've seen it uh, i mean probably two or three times prior to watching it here over this last week or so i i didn't have like this compelling reason necessarily to pick it other than i didn't necessarily want to i mean we, we talked about rock and roll high school I didn't want to go too far back right off the bat, like, oh, let's do Citizen Kane or let's do something like, of that kind of style or, 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 or something that's that old. I felt like The Graduate, it's now, what is it, 52, 53, I guess, years old. It came out yeah. in 1967. Still pretty old, but it's kind of a newer classic, if that makes any sense. I enjoy the film a great deal. I definitely had some different reactions on it this time. I will say... Is I, it your Untouchables? No, no. Uh, what, yes. what? No, I, I wouldn't say that. We'll get to that in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we'll have to talk about that. But uh, I, I will say I still enjoy... It, it's definitely a movie of, of two parts, right? Of two yeah. halves. The first part is you have the Benjamin character having an affair with Mrs. Robinson. And then the second part is when he starts to take an interest in her daughter, Elaine. Yeah. The first part I still adore. I think the first part is really great. I think Anne Bancroft looks great. And she was only, I think six years older than Dustin Hoffman yeah. when they were shooting this movie. So it's not like she's, she was playing much older in the film. He was playing much younger cause he was about 30. He was like so. in his mid thirties, I think. Uh, so, you know, he's playing a 20-year-old. She's playing a, somewhere north of 40. You don't really know. But she does make a, 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 a comment at some point in the film that she's twice his age or, or whatever. Yeah. The second part of the movie was not as good to me as, as it was, I guess, in the past. It's probably been 10 or 15 years since I saw this movie the last time. So I, I've definitely, you know, had some life experience or whatever since that time. I think his behavior in the second part of the movie is just so damn creepy, right? I mean, he's basically stalking her. Oh, yes. And, and I mean, I, I, it's not like I didn't see that or I missed that the first few times I saw this film. But I don't know if it's just because of kind of the climate we're in now or what. But I definitely was like, God, this lady needs to get a restraining order against him because it's just... He was like Weird. on the bus. He was he went to her campus and just like yeah. chilled. Like yeah. like my college had more than one building. Like so he's just waiting outside a yeah. random building. I know. I was like, how is he gonna find her? Because yes. what, what, what they're at UC Berkeley, is that yeah, right? It's yeah, so, be, yeah, so it's huge like, college. Yeah, I I don't know how he managed to to find her, but but he did. Yep. But yeah, yeah I, I that that second part of the film. It's weird because the first part of the film to me is very bleak and kind of dreary. There are the parts where he's in the pool, so that's out in the sunshine. But a lot of it is in dingy kind of hotel rooms, dark hotel rooms, yeah. or at night. The second part of the film is when he's actually kind of out in outdoors and he's following her to the campus and he's running after the bus and they go to the zoo and, and, and all this other stuff. So it's a lot brighter as far as that goes, but just him kind of, stalking her basically i mean there's no other way to put it he's stalking her is just bizarre and, and i don't i don't know that i necessarily buy really any of their behavior yeah. in that second part of the movie you have to go with it you know that's just where the movie goes but 
it's just weird. I, I, I don't know how, what, other, what other word to describe it. It's just very weird. Yep. What, what do you think? Well, welcome to Adam Hates Movies. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the weekly film series where I talk about... Um, man, it would be so much easier if I could just say I really like this movie. And, you know, I was talking to Kirby about it a bit. And for me, and maybe it's more of this movie's time because this movie does take place in the late 60s. And yeah. growing up when I did, because, you know, obviously I'm not in my 50s or my 70s. So You're not? No. <laughs> I have great skincare routine, guys. Uh, so maybe trying to extrapolate and understand what it was like back then, a little bit is not, I'm um, losing it in translation. So for me, the biggest part of the movie that kind of set me off or like didn't sit well with me was De- Dennis Hoffman's or Dustin Hoffman, sorry, um, portrayal of his character. I feel like he plays him way too young. Like I know he's in his 30s. I think he's in his mid 30s when he's playing this. But to me, his character comes off as a 14, 15 year old, not someone who's graduated from college, who's lived on their, their own. And I think maybe if I intellectualize it a little bit, you know, they're trying to show that he's kind of lived this sheltered life that his parents kind of have, um, you know, told him to do things. You know, when he has like the birthday party and he's dressed up in the scuba gear, you can definitely tell it's not something he wants, but something his parents force on him. Mm -hmm. So maybe the movie's trying to do that. But all of his interactions with the, you know, the older lady with Mrs. Robinson and all that stuff. He just played it so young to me. It just kept on throwing me out of the movie because I felt like if I was in his shoes, I would play it a lot cooler than that. And maybe that speaks more for me. But I feel like when we talk about Adventureland, you know, Jesse Eisenberg's character also is a virgin, also is post-college, but he isn't as neurotic as Dennis, as Dustin Hoffman's character, right? Yeah. And I feel like, so I feel like Jesse Eisenberg's portrayal is more true to how a real person would be, whereas Dustin Hoffman's to me just felt very elevated, and the whole time it just was really unnerving and hard for me to kind of settle into that performance the whole time. So I felt like it was like a 30-year-old playing a 14-year-old kind of the whole time. So that kind of threw me off, and it was really hard for me to kind of take the movie as is whenever... You know, every time he's acting this way, I just feel like he's playing it way too young. Gotcha. I I do think you're going to find as the more kind of older films that you watch, I mean, they're definitely not going to be like the newer films. Yeah, yeah. And they're definitely the the case in point. The second half of the film, you know, this is a guy who has slept with this girl's mother, <laughs> and, and and who who honestly Elaine the the daughter thinks that he raped her mother at first, right? And I she mean, forgives him within like a day, <laughs> right? I mean, she, she's yeah, she well, she's forgiving once once he kind of explains what yes. happened. I I don't think he ever really tells her that he he had sex with her mother repeatedly. Uh, I but he tells her so he tells her once when they're in the car after they have their first date, right? So he says, like, he doesn't say it's her mom, but he says that yeah. he had this affair with an older lady, right? Yeah. And then, like you said, her mom said that she he raped her, mm-hmm. and then he clarified it. But I think after that, she's like, all right, yeah, I do. I maybe will marry you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it not only goes from, oh, I forgive you for having sex with my mother, yeah. but also, you know what? I I might marry you. You know, I might I might do that. Give me a week. Yeah, so it, <laughs> and we'll it, plan a wedding in a week. It, it's it's <laughs> obviously, as you said, it, yeah. it's a, it's from a different era. It is very much a product of its time. I, a lot of these older movies, though, do have situations like that where the two characters confess their love for each other in like a twenty four yeah. hour period, or they 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 plan on getting married in a twenty four hour period, and you just. Unfortunately, you just kind of have to either buy it or you don't yeah. buy it. And if you don't buy it, you're probably not going to enjoy a, a lot of this stuff. But uh, I was going to say, they, in the second part of the movie, when they do that, I think it's partially justified by the fact that she doesn't want to end up like her mother. She mm-hmm. doesn't. She likes this Carl Smith guy that's also asked her to marry him, but he's supposed to kind of represent... Yeah what her father has grown into. I, I feel interesting. And so I think that, well, because you know, she, she says, 
when they're at the church and they're fighting off their parents and her mother says, it's too late for you, Elaine, or something like that. And she, or it's too late. And she says, not for me. So she doesn't want to be her mother. So I think that that's why she's toying with the idea of, you know what? I could marry this Carl Smith guy and he has the stability. He's not, he doesn't have that blank stare that Dustin Hoffman has for much of the movie. Or I could marry for, I guess, I guess love, although it's, Kind of an odd love, seeing as how he had sex with her mother. I, I was going to say also one thing. In my memory, this movie, like thinking back on it before I watched it recently, I thought it had a happy ending. And watching yeah. it this time, I don't think it's a happy ending at all. I think that they are caught up in the moment. She says, oh, well, I don't want to be with this Carl Smith guy. I want to be with Benjamin for love. I don't want to be with him and grow up and to be like my mother and have a loveless marriage and sleep in separate bedrooms. They run off. They get on the bus. They're happy. They're giddy. They're laughing. They sit down, and that laughing very quickly yeah. subsides. Yeah. And he, again, gets that thousand-yard stare in his face and, and just kind of <laughs> what I can he just doesn't know what he wants yeah. to do. And she very kind of nervously looks at him as if to say, oh, where do we go from here? And then the bus drives away. I think it's very ambiguous. I, I honestly, I don't think they have a happy ending. Yeah. I, I think that I it's think they break up. Pro after. Probably so, because it, it, that's the most sensible thing to do. Yeah. The fact that they're even getting together in the first place is such an oddball yeah. thing to have happen. So, yeah. I mean, so I do want to talk more about the ending a little bit, but I kind of want to jump before that. But I do feel the ending's very, very compressed. And I feel like maybe this is of the 60s, but, you know, even getting stringing a weather, oh, stringing together a wedding within a week is crazy. Even if the guy's already asked you and all that kind of stuff, that's crazy. But so for me, like, and this is probably something you, everyone's going to hear a lot of because this is something that kind of helps me is I wish there was more, I wish there was more, I wish Dustin Hoffman talked more about his motivations. I wish he would vocalize and say what he was doing. And maybe this is the kind of movie it is where he's supposed to be kind of just like passed around or just kind of passed by and just kind of, you know, going with the flow kind of stuff. But I wish he would vocalize or it was vocalized to us why he's sleeping with this older woman. Is it a, is it because of the opportunity? Is he attracted to her? I mean, he says he's attracted to her, but you know, I don't know what his motivations are for sleeping with her. Mm -hmm. Is it just a past time? Is it a summer fling? And all that kind of stuff. And I feel like if he did that, it would help me understand a little bit kind of what his headspace is a little bit. Because I think, you know, for this whole movie, you know, you think about it, a protagonist is supposed to be the character that changes the most throughout the whole movie. Mm -hmm. And there could be arguments for like, you know, a little bit of like slice of life kind of movies. There's not going to be a big change. But for most movies, you know, you're looking for that main character to change over a whole lot. And I don't see a big change for him in this movie. I feel like he is the same kind of character at the beginning of the movie as he is at the end. Maybe an argument we made that him going and breaking up the wedding is kind of a big step for him and kind of a something he would do outside his own comfort zone. But definitely, like you're saying, at the end shot with that thousand yard stare, that's something we've seen him do all the throughout movie. the movie. So he sure. hasn't really changed a whole lot, and maybe that is something they're going for. Mike Nichols, I think, right? I think it is. I think for. that's. I, I I think that's kind of the point. He he doesn't really change, but he wants Elaine to think that he's changed, and he 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 desperately wants that change, but he he still doesn't get it. As we can see at the end, when he's riding away on the bus, he just kind of goes back to his usual staring blankly self. Yeah. So I just wish that I kind of, I wish I was, there was an opportunity for me to get more into his head so I can kind of understand his motivations and understand why he's feeling this way or what's going on. And, and, you know, like I said, that might be just a stylistic or a, you know, script choice, but that's, that's kind of where it's really difficult for me to kind of feel and kind of follow the movie along is when I don't know, you know, what the main character's doing. I don't, it, it, to me, it feels like he doesn't really have any agency. And maybe this movie is about him not having agency, but, you know, I don't know what his wants, what his needs are kind of in this movie. You know, and even with, like, Adventureland, you know, he's kind of aimlessly kind of doing this summer kind of thing, but you know that his goal is to go to New York, is to be a writer and stuff like that. So you kind of see these kind of big goals 
for him. So it's easy for me to kind of be like, okay, I understand where he wants. I can follow him on this ride. I can empathize with him. But with Dustin Hoffman's, you know, Zach Braniff character, I just feel like, you know, he's having all these options forced upon him and stuff. And I think that's what this movie is trying to talk about. But you never really get a sense of, this is, hey, this is what I want. I never feel like he's like grabbing life by the reins. And that's kind of frustrating and off-putting for me. It's hard for me to kind of sympathize with him. Yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. I, it, that doesn't necessarily bother me. I, I, I mean, I, I think that he he's just confused. He yeah. doesn't really know what he wants out of life. At the beginning of the movie, he's 20 years old, which is pretty darn young. I mean, I guess he, he's a, he was a whiz kid. He graduated <laughs> from college at 20. Yeah. And he's about to turn 21, as he says, in a week. But he just really doesn't know what the hell he wants to do with his life. I, I but I, I can see what you're saying about you you don't get enough glimpse. More than anything, you just get him kind of wandering around and staring at things and drifting yeah. in the pool. But I, I obviously the the whole drifting thing and going back to him being underwater and you know being you know water being in over his head is meant to symbolize him. And that's where he is in life. Yeah. He's he's confused by everything. He's sinking. He you know he's all of those kinds of things. Um, so what do you think Mrs. Robinson's motivations were for this? Was she trying to get back at her husband or was she looking for just something? Was she just kind of fed up with life and wanted something to do? Like what, what do you think her kind of, I, I, I think that she is fed up with being in a loveless marriage. I, honestly, I was wondering, has she done this sort of thing before with somebody else? I did too. I think and I think she did. Yeah, probably. I feel probably like so. I feel like she's just like on the prowl, on the prowl, right? Yeah, maybe so. Every summer she's just finding a new. Maybe so. But yeah, no, I definitely yeah. had. I want you to extrapolate on that, but I, yeah. I definitely felt like this is not her first time doing this. Right. Right. Yeah, because you know you were saying you you're not as as sure of his motives or or what is in his head. I think a lot of it. I think. He is kind of curious. You know, initially he turns her down or he's, yeah. he's very weirded out by the whole thing. But I think as the summer goes on and he's still stuck in this, oh gosh, what am I going to do with my life? He's bored. He reaches out to her, but she is very manipulative when it comes to him. She yeah. says and does things. She taunts his manhood, basically, <laughs> at one point when yeah. they first have sex in the hotel room because he's all of a sudden getting cold feet. Yep. And she's like, oh, you're a virgin. Oh, you don't know what yeah. you're doing, basically. And he's like, oh, I'll show you. I know what I'm doing. You know, So she she's very yeah. manipulative as far as that goes. So she definitely, he, he takes a couple of steps, but she grabs him and pulls yeah. him all the way in, For right? Sure. I mean. So yeah, yeah, I th and I definitely feel like that kind of interaction shows that she's probably done this probably before, done right? that sort of thing before. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I was just gonna jump. I wanted to talk about. I know we have to talk about Simon and uh, oh no, it's not Simon and Garfunkel is a parody band. Hall and Oates, um, well, and their music. Garfunkel and Oates is oh the parody. <laughs> I, I Simon don't, and Garfunkel. Why are we doing this? I don't know anything about anything. So, yeah, si Simon and Garfunkel. The soundtrack is obviously very acclaimed. I don't I know say it. I know there's a lot of praise it. for it. Don't say it. They paid for three songs, <laughs> and boy, did they get their money's worth out of those three songs. Oh, <laughs> they God. played the no. Um, no, they played the uh, was it the Canterbury. Uh, so there's a Scarborough Fair. Scarborough Fair, they played that four or five times. <laughs> yeah. it's so much that I started counting because I was like, oh my gosh, we're hearing the same thing you again. You felt like it was the Rock and Roll High School all over. It's the Ramones, just over and over. No. The Ramones had more songs in Rock and Roll High School than we had Simon Garfunkel. Yeah, that, so, yeah uh, I think they did. There's three. There's three. And we didn't even get like full Mrs. Robinson. We got the doot doot doot, and then we got the... Him, <laughs> he got the car, and that's Mrs. it. Robinson. Like yeah. I would have preferred more, more Mrs. Robinson. But is yeah, it really, I, is it really okay? So they do Mrs. Robinson. They do Scarborough Fair. They do Sounds of Silence. They did that, and they did that at the beginning and the end, which also shows that his character hasn't changed. And there you go. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, but they, I, I, had, I do have to point. They also use a song in there called "April Comes She Will." They, is that they, yeah? That's a fourth one. And so there's four, at least four. There might but, be more, but there's at least four. I just feel like. It was too much. I I understand. So my hope my hope for this is that as we do more of these, it's easier for me to kind of get into that mindset of that time period and I'm able to enjoy the movies for what they are. 
but I'm just, I'm trying to be honest and I'm trying to, and I'm trying to give the movies the benefit of doubt and kind of do that stuff, but it's hard with a very modern sensibility to look at some of these older films. And again, that's something I want to be able to do and do better. And that's why we're kind of doing this stuff, doing this podcast and talking about it. But for me right now, it was just like, oh my gosh. We're hearing it again. The I, same I, song again. I do feel like you you will you are definitely going to have to kind of switch gears yeah. to do that. I, I mean, obviously, I think it, it helped me seeing this movie years and years ago. If I was seeing it for the first time, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe I would feel similar to the way that you do. As it stands, I still like the movie very much. I, my biggest problem was kind of the second half of the film. I thought their behavior, uh, both of them. I mean, yeah. not just not just Benjamin, but Benjamin and Elaine. I thought their behavior is just bizarre. I mean, I, I would never. If somebody said, "Oh, by the way, I had sex with one of your parents," I'm pretty sure I would yeah. be like, "All right, I don't ever want to see you again." Yeah, yeah. And if they did show up, I'm getting a restraining order. Something is happening. They're not going to be around me. But she's. She's she's not really creeped out by the fact that he comes around. She it seems like she's just more annoyed than anything. Yes. But 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 it pretty quickly it's like, "Oh, Benjamin, I I really do love you." And I mean, yes, they they did have a connection on their first date. They had a great time. They were excited about going out on the second date. They had a very interesting first date. They did have a very interesting first date. I I did want to ask you uh, uh what do you think or what did you think about because I like a lot of the shots in the movie. I yeah. like the way that things are are composed. Obviously everybody knows the it's she's got her leg up yeah. and and he's but yeah. uh there's a lot of there's a lot of long takes in the movie and things of that nature did did any of that strike you as good or bad or That's different? Good, eh. So I do feel and again this is another one of my preferences is you know, for me, whenever I feel like you the movie is like directed and there's a lot of camera moves and stuff like that, it does take me out of the movie. Mm-hmm. So there were a few shots that I felt were very like arts artistically done and like framed. Mm-hmm. And every time those kind of shots happen, it just like my my brain just clicks and I'm you don't out of the like movie. That. No, it takes me out of the movie. Like I don't know why it does that, but sometimes for those shots, and especially with like cinema verte and like shaky cam stuff well yeah that, i mean that that's my episode. brain just kick, clicks in and it's like well i know they're trying to do this to be realistic but why are they framing it this way like what are we trying to look at like all of a sudden my like film director brain or whatever kicks on and i'm trying to figure out like the reasoning behind the different shots so for the most part i was in the movie and i liked a lot of shots some of the ones that stood out to me was definitely the leg shot but i knew that was going to st- stand out to me because we've seen that a thousand times yeah um, they were doing a lot with like her reflection on the table at the restaurant. And every time it kind of like would have her and have her like she'd step in the frame and all you would see was her reflection on the table. Like instantly I'm like, oh, obviously they wanted to do that. And they're trying to do that first. You know, my brain's like trying to rationalize what's the reasoning why they're trying to do that? Why are they trying to show like those kind of shots kind of just take me out of the movie. Mm. Again, it's something I need to work on, <laughs> I need to work on and. It's something I'm hoping I get more used to over time. But for the most part, I felt the movie was really well directed. But there were a few shots where, you know, it would just kick me out of the movie. And I'm just like, okay, well, we're showing this shot because we think it's a interesting reveal for the character or says something about the movie and that. Well, I, I like I like again I like some of the long takes. I like when he comes over when he drives her home the first time and yeah. he's he doesn't want to come up the stairs. He's like, well, I'm just gonna leave it here. All I think I think all a lot of that is done just in one take and one, in one shot. I like that stuff. I love. I thought that was good. I love when it's revealed to Elaine that he has been sleeping with her mother. The way that that's revealed, he runs upstairs. You know, it's raining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He runs upstairs. She's not yeah. even ready. She's holding something in front. And then so you know, he's like, you know, I, I yeah. want to tell you that mother. And he, there's water dripping down his face. I, Elaine is by, right by the door, and she turns, and her mother's face is right there yeah. within the door frame. I love that. I, that that kind of stuff. I just eat it up. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's no, good I, stuff. I think that was very good. That that didn't jump out as me as something that took me out of the movie. Yeah. So I was on board for all that. Good um, deal. <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to talk more about like the ending and just how weird that whole ending was. I mean, I know we spent a lot of time with it, but just like getting a wedding together 
<laughs> in a week is forget just that. So weird. <laughs> forget forget the logistics. But the thing for me is, I'm trying to figure out is like, were they trying to compress a big time frame from the book in that last couple, that last act? I have no idea. I I, I know yeah. very little about the, the how the book was translated yeah. to the screen. I, and I want to see. I mean, I definitely want to see like a Wayne's World two, uh, you know, graduate mashup because I I'm pretty sure all those shots are exactly the same. I I know it's the same church and everything, but yeah. I thought that was good. So if you've seen Wayne's World two, you've already seen you know a good ten minutes of the graduate. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So that is our yeah. review on the graduate. I I liked it. It's something I want to revisit again. Hopefully, it's something I warm up to more, but. You know, for me, it's kind of hard, you know, watching the movie with kind of modern sensibilities. And, you know, I kind of wanted something a little bit different. Definitely wanted, and I'm sure Dustin Hoffman got, I know he got a lot of accolades for it. I just wish he played it more subtle and played it a little bit older. I think would have made me like the movie a whole lot more. Got it. And you're, you think I'm wrong. I mean, <laughs> I, I do. I mean, I, I, I think I like the movie a heck of a lot more than you do. But, but again... I, I I like this podcast. I like the ability for you to see movies that you've not seen and for me to have a chance to revisit these movies because I was going to mention a lot of these movies that we're going to go through, particularly on your list, I, a lot of them, it's, they fall into the same bucket as The Graduate in that I've probably seen them two or three times, yeah. but I have not seen any of them in probably Recently. 10 plus years. And the reason for that is because I watched all these classic movies back in the day when your only options were to go to the video store or watch something that you already owned. Yeah. Nowadays, we've got a plethora of streaming services like Netflix and Hulu and all this other stuff. There's so much content. I just don't find the time to go back and revisit these. So it's a perfect opportunity for me to view it with you know older eyes and an older mind and, yeah. and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I like it. I dig it. And I promise I will eventually like one of these movies. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So um, please subscribe to the podcast. Um, send us an email at realshame at gmail.com. Uh, follow us on Instagram. And next week, or not next week, but the next review we're going to do is... Kicking and screaming, kind of still going along with that post-college malaise theme. We're gonna and not the Will Ferrell not kicking Will and screaming. Ferrell, this is kicking and screaming. Noah Bombbox, I believe it's his first film from yeah. 1995. So we'll talk about that next time. All right, thank you guys. Mm-hmm.